Really, I did change my title a little bit to the material culture uh, in the royal nomadic court of the imperial period. Uh, I think it's a little bit more specific on what I'm presenting to you today, which are some of the daily use objects within the imperial court, uh, clothing, uh, objects of tableware and uh, military sort of dress and regalia. What I want to do today, and, and I might walk away, can you hear me okay if I step away from the microphone? Okay, great. Um, what I want to do today is try to paint a picture for you of the earliest part of the Tibetan Empire in the 7th century and early 8th century. Mostly when we study early Tibetan history, we study the Buddhist history and the history that surrounds the conversion of Tibet to Buddhism. So oftentimes when people talk about the Tibetan Empire, they talk about the early influences that China and India had on Tibet in terms of its conversion to Buddhism. For that reason, oftentimes we see a lot of images of Buddhas, of temples, of lamas and monks. What I'm going to show you today is sort of the other side of the Tibetan Empire, uh, around kingship and ministers, uh, the military, banquets, marriages, and like that. But I'm starting with an image of the Buddha because I think this image is very emblematic of the early kings of Tibet. Uh, it's a later sculpture from the 11th century, but it depicts the Buddha Vairochana, who is the principal Buddha in the Yoga Tantras, as a Tibetan king. And this was the image that Tibetan kings modeled themselves after. They wanted to become universal conquerors, universal monarchs, and great Dharma Rajas of Tibet. And so we see here an image of Vairochana dressed in royal garb. It's very unusual to see wearing the heavy Central Asian cloaks with the sort of classic Sasanian uh, designs and patterns on the lapels and these sort of heavy nomadic boots. The Tibetans were very unique in this short history of empire building between the 7th and 9th century in that they really got to choose from a number of cultures around them in how they represented themselves to the world. So from India they chose Buddhism, uh, Vajrayana Buddhism from the Gangetic Plain which they brought up. From China, they brought in administrative culture and organized their military and their documentation following the Tang Chinese. But in terms of their representation of kingship, of royalty, of the sort of uh, luxuries that come with imperial conquest, they really looked west to the ancient Near East, to more Eurasian cultures and specifically to ancient Persia for their models of kingship. I'm going to focus today mainly around Songsen Gampo, who is one of the first imperial kings of Tibet. And I hope to show you through some of the material culture of that time how much Tibet relied on Sasanian and Sogdian motifs for their ideas of heroism, uh, the military, kingship, and really sort of opulent luxury. Again, we see this is a later sculpture of Songsen Gampo, depicted here as a bodhisattva with the head of Amitabha protruding out of his crown. But again, you see this very nomadic Central Asian robe that he's wearing, again with these classic uh, rondelles, pearl rondelles on his lapel. This is another important figure in the narrative that uh, I'm going to tell today, and that's Songsen Gampo's main minister, Minister Gar. 
Uh, Minister Gar, as many of you uh, know who know Tibetan history, is really the man behind the scenes. He's the person who went to the Tang courts to request a princess for Songsen Gampo, and he was one of the most learned Tibetans uh, at the time of the consolidating of the Tibetan Empire. So just some basic figures and, and some dates. Namri Songsen is the grandfather of Songsen Gampo, and he first began to consolidate the tribes around the area of Lhasa. Before this time, Tibet was really a dispersed nomadic community, and Namri Songsen first united the clans around Lhasa. Songsen Gampo, after him, united all the great clans of the Yarlung Valley in southern Tibet. And it was really with him that the Tibetan Empire expanded, and it's with him that we'll focus. After that, Trisong Detsen is the next major emperor. There are a few others between him. And he continues to expand the empire and establish Tibet as a Buddhist kingdom. And it's really from his time on, so from the late mid 8th century through the 9th century, that Tibet becomes a Buddhist empire. Prior to that time, it was not really so Buddhistic. They were much more uh, a nomadic band of clans who were expanding an empire, so very militaristic. To give you an idea of how rapidly the Tibetan Empire expanded, I list some of these dates, but in order to save time, I won't go through them. But just to show you, between 627 and 704, the Tibetan Empire accomplished amazing military feats. They, they defeated the Tuyu Hun uh, in the east, sort of in Amdo area, and immediately closed the borders between Tibet and Tang China before the Aja people, the Tuyu Hun, were a sort of buffer between them. Quickly after, they defeated uh, Khotan and Gilgit areas, and not long after, they took over the four garrisons area that previously China had controlled, and they dominated the Tarim Basin, essentially controlling the entire Silk Road. And it was at that time that they came into contact with the artisans that had moved from the Sasanian Empire, which collapsed around the end of the 7th century, into Central Asia, bringing with them primarily uh, with the communities, the Sogdian communities, the arts of the Sasanian Empire, before then the Parthians, the Byzantines, and really going all the way back to Rome. To give you an idea of the link between Rome and Tibet, Tibetan medicine is closer linked to Greek medicine than it is to Indian or Chinese. The map is perhaps a better way to show how quickly this expansion happened over a 50-year period. Here we can really see the western gate of the Silk Road around Khotan, the Tarim Basin, and, and the diverse communities between the Turkish Kaganites, the Tang uh, Imperial Court, and the Tibetans. In this area around the Tarim Basin, you can see in just a matter of 30 years, Tibet f went from being not even on the scene to here this whole dotted line controlling the whole of the four garrisons and really controlling all the way up to Turfan, which was a great stronghold of Sogdian artists. This map is just to give you an idea of the expanse of the Tibetan Empire. When it was at its height, it was one of the largest empires in the world. It rivaled with the Mongolian Empire, which was the largest, the Roman is the next, and then after that, the Tibetan Empire in terms of land mass. And you can see how much of Central Asia they controlled. So not only were they going up to Fergana and bordering on ancient uh, Sogdiana, but they were also into the steppe and the uh, Altai people and in uh, Turfan, which is a major point of art production. Our earliest 
depiction of a Tibetan. Now I have to sort of uh, put a caveat around this because there are early depictions of people in Tibet that are prehistoric, pre prehistoric, but this is the earliest depiction of a Tibetan in a sort of civilized manner. This is a painting I'm sure many of you know. It's a very famous painting uh, done in the 7th century uh, from the Tong Court. And this is Minister Gar in the middle here requesting a princess for the emperor of Tibet, Songtsen Gampo. He was refused a princess initially, and Tibet then conquered the Asha people and threatened to invade Tibet, at which point a princess was given. And Tibet carried on this tradition of marriage alliances, so marrying queens from Gilgit, from Swat, from Asha, <coughs> from Kathmandu or Nepal at the time, uh, into Tibet. And I just want to point out here, this is in the late 7th century this painting was done, and here we see Minister Gar on the left again in this sort of typical Central Asian garb. And this kind of fabric you can see, I'm sure, all over uh, the art fair now, but you see it all around the world. And we even find evidence of this silk as far as Japan from the 7th century. And iconic of it are, as I said, the Sasanian rondelles that you see all on the cloak. So I now want to go into how the Tibetans consolidated their empire and the material that came around. And a lot of this focuses around the royal hunt. Now, the royal hunt was not done for sustenance purposes. The purpose of the royal hunt was really a military exercise. To give you an idea of what would happen, Thousands, if not tens of thousands, of cavalrymen would form a huge circle spanning hundreds of kilometers. And over the course of days and weeks, that circle would slowly begin to close in to one designated space, hurting all the animals around. So that would include tigers from the far southern parts of Tibet to wild yak, jackals, wolves, goats, uh, wild goats, of course, sheep, every wild animal into one space. They would be corralled into that space and then the royal hunt would ensue. This is something that we see all across Eurasian culture. In Rome, in the Colosseum, they would erect a wilderness within the Colosseum and then allow the aristocracy and the king to hunt wild animals that would be released slowly. And only the king would be allowed to hunt the most sort of ferocious animal, the lion or the tiger. In Tibet, it would have been the wild yak, the drong, which is at least two times the size of wild yak today. Here we see a quiver cover plate uh, from the 7th century, the late 7th century. And depicted on it is a king on horseback spearing a lion. Now, there were not really lions in Tibet at this time. Probably there were tigers. But this is an imagery that you see very often in Sasanian art, where a king is hunting a lion or a tiger. In this instance, we have the spear going across and actually the moment of the kill being depicted. And what's so remarkable about this is not only the incredible accuracy of the depiction of the horse and rider, but the connection being made between the emperor and the lion, essentially drawing the connection between this heraldic animal and the king. This is a very important uh, concept in terms of the royal hunt, because in all depictions that we see of hunting, it's only the kings that would be killing such noble animals as the lion, or in other cases, as we'll see, uh, the yak. In the old tongue annals, and I should just sort of preface this a little bit, we don't have a lot of written material from the Tibetan Empire. Essentially, it comes down to the old Tibetan annals, which is chronicle year to year, and the old Tibetan chronicle, which is really a mythic 
history of the early Tibetan kings. After that, we have some epigraphic material with pillar stones uh, and some inscriptions, but otherwise there's very little historical documents. So the material objects that are coming around in the last sort of 30 years really add a lot of color to our understanding of the Tibetan Empire. This is from the old Tibetan annals, and I hope you've read it uh, while I've been speaking, but essentially in the year 653-654, uh, the chief minister Gar, who I mentioned before, held a great yak hunt. Why is this important? We see only three great royal hunts happen, and they're all in the early part of the Tibetan Empire. The reason why this is as important is it's a military exercise because in order to accomplish that great feat of getting tens of thousands of cavalrymen to draw into one location needs great military administration. You have to coordinate this immense circle to consolidate into one small area. The times that they had their royal hunts coincide to some of their great uh, military campaigns into the Terran Basin and into China. And what we see is that these royal hunts also correspond to tax collection and subduing any internal unrest or um, sort of uprisings that might happen. So the royal hunts are also a way of displaying the power of the Tibetan kings and this group of clans that banded together. Here we see on a painted coffin panel the depiction of a tsempo with the head wrap hunting the wild yak. It's sort of in the heat of the moment, the horse is in full gallop, the yak is you know, completely crazy, running away, and we see the hunting going on. But what we also see are many other animals running around in a very closed area. Again, there would be also connected with the yak is a ritual slaughter. Now, there's a great narrative that comes in the old Tibetan chronicles that talks about Drigum Tsempo, who's one of the early kings, a uh, sort of mythic king of Tibet. And at this time, Drigum Tsempo is still considered a god. And he's a little bit of an arrogant figure, a little bit belligerent, because now he's into the human realm. And he starts to challenge his ministers. And he says, who dares challenge me as my enemy? Who dares take on the role of the wild yak? essentially drawing this connection between the temple, the emperor, and the wild yak, that only the emperor can kill a wild yak. Well, this narrative then turns into a ritual sacrifice, which we can still see elements of in borderland regions of the Himalayas, not with yaks, often with other smaller animals. But here we see a ritual slaughter of a wild yak, where there's a temple up top and a tethered yak down below. Again, a couple years later, the same minister held a royal hunt. Only two years later. So you can imagine the importance of having a royal hunt is not, again, as I said, for food. It's a huge expense but it's a way of displaying your power and showing not only to your own country and, and uh, uh, sort of communities that you can achieve such a complex administrative goal, but also to display to the neighboring kingdoms around and empires that you know, you, you've got your act together and you are a serious power to contend with. Again, this is another quiver cover. Now, to give you an idea, I think I have a close-up. You can see the quiver, because it's a little hard to understand. You can see the quiver right here. It's an inverted triangle to hold the arrows. And it would have been made of a very light wood. Uh, and then this gold repoussé cover as a plate to go on top of it. Again, we see a royal hunt or not a royal hunt, excuse me, a hunt scene going on. And this time it's a stag hunt. Uh, in the previous slide from the Tibetan Annals, it was a great stag hunt 
that was held. This is the whole scene from uh, the coffin panel. And you can see just the sort of uh, uh, circus that's going on. There's so many animals running around in a small space. This isn't a typical hunt where you might go and chase one herd of stag or a herd of yak. There are many different animals in a closed space. Because in a royal hunt, as I said, you would corral huge amounts of animals into this small space to then hunt. You can imagine it was completely crazy. If any of you have been to Tibet, uh, maybe a horse race or some other large festivals, all the people gather around. Spectators, the athletes, they're all in one closed space. It's very dangerous. And we can see that here as well. There are spectators around hitting the animals back into the hunting space. Uh, not too long ago, from the manuscripts found in Cave 17 at Dunhuang, uh, there was a study of Paleo uh, 1027, which gave laws for hunting yaks. And it was a little odd to see this. These were some of the only laws that we found uh, depicting, or rather writing about, what you do if someone falls under a yak. If you save the person, it's considered very meritorious. If you don't save the person and they die under the yak, it's punishable by death. And if it's a minister that dies under a yak, it's a certain kind of punishment. If it's a king that dies under a yak, it's another kind of punishment. This seemed very odd at first, but in consideration of rules regulating the royal hunt, it makes perfect sense because there's a lot of spectators around and you can see there's a lot of sort of mismanagement and should someone fall under their horse or a yak, you would expect them to be saved. Here just an idea of this sort of cacophony of madness going on. You can see one figure accidentally spearing the horse of another rider. So it was well understood that these were dangerous events going on and that it was a display of riders skill and coordination to participate in the royal hunt. So now I'm going to move off of uh, the quivers that I showed you in scenes of the royal hunt and go to the culture around the horse. Now the horse has been made a mythic animal really throughout the entire Northern Hemisphere, throughout all of Eurasia, mainly because the horse was not only believed to be a sacred animal, but some, uh, a, an animal that carried the rider through this lifetime and then through the next life. For that reason, what we find in burial sites are often all of the uh, objects that would have gone to uh, decorate a horse. Oftentimes we don't find horses, uh, but we do in some cases, because the horse would have been uh, eaten in a ritual slaughter, and then just all of those implements buried with the king or queen. So from the early Iron Age through the Middle Ages, saddles and uh, horse fixings haven't really changed that much. So through the 7th, 8th century, all the way through to the 12th century, 13th century, uh, horse saddles and fixings are very similar to each other. So as I'm sure many of you have seen, both the uh, pommel and, and, and cantle of the saddle uh, are very similar with other areas, whether it's Sasanid or Chinese or Mongolian or Indian. So the back of the saddle is this uh, sort of bow arch, and the front of the saddle, the pommel, is, is this sort of high-peaked arch. Um, a lot of saddles are coming around nowadays. We see them largely from the Yuan period. I just want to give you an idea of how ornate and opulent the saddles of the Tibetan kings were, integrating both silks and gold work from Central Asia, largely done by Sogdian artists. 
So here again we see these classic pearl rondelles with uh, two facing lions. Again, a very um, noble image for both riders and the king in Tibet. And you'll see on many of the saddles, there are these mythic animals which are common throughout uh, the Tang Dynasty and the Sasanid Empire, but they're always in full action. They're never sedentary animals. We'll find sometimes uh, roaring lions or sort of up on their heels or running deer. In this case we can see this mythic sort of uh, unicorn almost. It's a, it's a pegasus of sorts, a horned uh, horse. So a lot of these saddles are uh, found not only within the Tibetan Empire, but we find them also uh, throughout the Himalayas uh, and largely, I have to say, the Yuan dynasty, the Yuan period of Mongol rule brought back the early period of saddles and those are our primary examples to look at. I just want to show you here the mythic animals. Previously it was thought, I think, from Tang uh, art that then it influenced towards Tibet. But as we begin to look at the art more, we see not the very exacting aesthetic of Tang artists and the Tang court, which would have had very similar um, mythic creatures, winged animals, but we see a much more nomadic aesthetic, more robust figures, stronger wings, uh, uh, really quite energetic animals. So you see the much thicker uh, wings, this very powerful neck. And just to kind of point out, this mythic creature has the neck of a phoenix. Uh, it has the face of a cow or a horse, the horns of a sort of mythic ram, the tail of a yak, the hooves of a horse, it's, it's a composite animal. But again, these are all images that are very emblematic of kingship and royalty in the Sogdian and Sasanid Empire, which were brought over largely with Zoroastrianism uh, incorporating them. So these are some small fixings that would have gone onto the bridle of the horse. And I just want to kind of give you a complete picture of how ornate horses would have been dressed. Oftentimes we thought, you know, these are burial objects, but more and more as we start to go through the text, as we start to see paintings like from the coffin panel, we can understand that these objects were more in use at the time and given largely as the almost dowry in marriage ceremonies, which I'll get to in a moment. But you can see on this Tang uh, ceramic horse, the actual fittings, the fixings being implemented and shown in another uh, object. So as we saw before, these square fixings with almost sort of rosettes or, or petals on the four corners and a dot in the middle is a very common design that you'll see on almost all fixings in variant forms. So you can see here again on the bit that same design being replicated and then the larger parts as a, as a sort of head cover. This is a reproduction of what all of these fixings might have looked like uh, when dressed on the horse and I want to use this time to say most of the material that I'm telling you today is really owed to Boris Marshak and this whole talk is in many ways in honor of Boris Marshak who uh, I and my parents got the fortunate opportunity over a few months to spend time with him to study many of these objects and to see the way that he brought his knowledge of Central Asia and Sogdiana to Tibetan material. And it was really he that reconstructed how many of these objects ought to look on a horse. Again, I just wanted to show you some of the fixings on the, on the bridle because, again, they're all animals in full energetic 
uh, uh, running mode. They would never want anything that was seated or sedentary on a horse that you're about to go into battle with. Whereas on cups, ewers, plates, we find a lot of animals seated in a more uh, domestic kind of state. But when it comes to uh, quivers, saddles, shields, we really find animals in their full energetic spirit, in a sense transferring over to the rider. These small silver figures were all cut out individually and then incised with uh, a, a very fine chisel and often smoothened over and using really what's called a, a dotting chisel to make all of this shading of the furs on the animal. And you can see here again another mythic animal combining both uh, the tail of a cow and the head of a bull and the horns of a ram, all, all sort of into this winged animal creature. Coming now to the royal encampment, uh, I can't really spend much time on this because we're just beginning to understand what the encampment would have looked like. But within the Tang annals, it describes that the Tibetans had a movable court and inside their tents, they were fully painted and covered in gold. What does that mean? How do you paint a tent? It's a little bit confusing. Uh, what we're finding more and more is, as silks start to appear is that the painting was not actual painting, but really silks that would have been hung to decorate the walls of the tents, which is not so outlandish. If any of you have sort of been around nomadic communities, you know textiles, carpets are used to decorate the entire interiors of their homes. Here we have a view again uh, in painting of what the tents would have looked like. And then inside of these tents, uh, elaborate uh, silk textiles, which I'm sure all of you have seen or will see, of animals, flowers, these incredible rondelles, and a mixture of colors such as reds and blues and greens to decorate the interior. Now, this is a series of gold gilded silver plates of Phoenix. Uh, there's a number of them in the set. And what I want to point out be sure, before I show you what Boris Marshak thought how they might have been arranged is really the difference between these and Tang Phoenixes. Unfortunately, I don't have an image of a Tang Phoenix at the moment, but for those of you that do know Chinese art, you'll be able to imagine a Tang Phoenix is much daintier in a way. It's much more exacting. The lines of the wings, the neck, are all in a very controlled fashion. Here we have something closer to almost Scythian art, Scythian art, excuse me, where it's nomadic, it's full-bodied. The wings of the phoenix are really flying up in the air. They're not just uh, sort of royally raised as you would see with the Tang uh, phoenixes. Also, the phoenix's tail, the plumage coming off its back, is not in a controlled, uh, almost peacock manner, but really is flying up like clouds behind the animal. It's full of energy, which I think is kind of emblematic of the, the character and spirit of the Tibetan Empire and its art. This is Boris Marshak's drawing uh, of how he imagined these phoenixes would have been composed. If they were done on a square plate, it would make much more sense if they would be on walls. But because they're round, the only way they really work architecturally is to be in a round and up above. This makes a lot of sense because the phoenix is an image not only of royalty and particularly of 
uh, queens, but it's also an image of the heavens and is often connected in Buddhism with the Sukhavati heavens, the, the Buddha realms uh, within Buddhism. So we would see the phoenixes on these lotuses up above. And it can be thought that perhaps within a tent like this, around that sort of uh, coned chimney there, that these phoenixes would have been placed on silk. And in fact, when conservation work was done on these uh, silver plates, they did find little bits of silk uh, in some of the holes and, and nooks of it. So I'm going to, uh, this is the last section here on banquets of silver and gold. Along with the royal hunts, which was a great chance to practice your military agility, there would be great feasts, huge banquets, but also uh, very elaborate oath rituals, which we see mostly in the Yuan period. We don't have big evidence of during the imperial period in Tibet, but it would be an oath rite with cups where the king would drink and pass the goblet around for all the ministers to drink from. So the royal hunts were also a way to reinforce the allegiance of these various clans that were always rivaling with each other. And here we see a depiction of the cup oath rite happening where a minister is offering the cup back up to the king or rather the king is offering it to the minister and the minister is sort of toasting him and drinking. We see some of the other elements that we would find in terms of uh, gold and silver uh, tableware. Down below this figure with the helmet on has a black uh, rite in, uh, in his hand used for drinking wine. These are some famous uh, silverware, and you can see that same horned Riton and uh, a vase and cup. Now the vase all the way to the left is most commonly used for uh, marriage rituals, and we see marriage rituals using these uh, vases mostly for dowry for the woman and the cup going to the man who's often in the military. So just to give you a few examples of this beautiful uh, silverware, and I realize I haven't been going through where most of these objects are. Uh, I apologize, I sort of skip over those types of things, not on purpose. These are in the um, Ashmolean Museum, uh, and it was very nice of Andrew Topsfield to lend me these photos from the Ashmolean. But you can see how, elaborate, uh, how elaborately decorated they are. Uh, this, is, this is another one uh, which really depicts not only the beauty of the marriage ceremony, but also some symbolic features for the union of the man and woman. And we get in mercury gilding on the silver uh, a backdrop of gold to these mythic animals. As I was talking, the symbolism for the union, uh, we get these uh, two uh, mandarin ducks with their uh, necks wrapped around each other. The mandarin duck in Chinese not only being uh, symbolic of uh, longevity and, and, and union, but sort of the loving couple both in this life and in the next life. And here, in a sort of romantic way, the artist has uh, put them in a, in a sort of very sensual pose in a way. As I mentioned, often the vases would be for the bride, for, for the female, and to the male, because he was uh, a rider in nomadic communities, the riders would always have their cup. The cup was sort of a, a, both a, an iconic feature of the rider and an emblem of the rider because at all times his cup would either be on his belt or at his mouth. And still today it's very common in Tibet uh, for both men and women to carry around their own cup with them at all times. You can see a very uh, Persian or Sassanid 
uh, design to the cup and we find many in uh, from the Tang period in China except those would be more oval shaped uh, cups or bowls with sort of burrows on the inside dividing the inside. In Tibet we have something closer to some of the ewers with little stems and then very uh, shallow bowls which is still a design copied in Tibet to this day. This last vessel, uh, I'm just going to end with a little bit of a story on this, um, on this cup, as, as I really call the Rider's Cup. What we see on this cup, and I, I apologize, they're not great images, but there's four diamonds that make up the outer band of the cup, all made of uh, repoussé silver, and then soldered onto the cup, and then mercury gilding done on the gold. And then these figures are carved out individually and really beautifully incised uh, with this um, dotting chisel and then smoothened out. This cup in particular, I have to say, is really quite extraordinary when you compare to all the cups out there with the amount of workmanship that went in to chiseling, chiseling I should say, incising uh, the figures, doing the mercury gilding, and creating the whole composition. I often think, and I'll get back to this, that we have the male lion and the female horse chasing each other, and really the horse running away, uh, an image of the woman, and the lion, as you can see here with his paw up, really in pursuit of her. And I'll get back to this in a moment. On the inside of the cup, it's equally elaborate. We have three fish in the center encircling each other, surrounded by uh, three concentric circles on the outside that make up the stems of alternating lotuses and flowers. So you can see the rose type flower in the middle there and then on the, out, on the outside are large lotus petals. On top of those lotus petals are mandarin ducks. So you can begin to see how elaborate this cup was even on the interior where liquid would have been poured. So how can we read this and how might we better understand these designs on both the vases, the ewers, the plates, the cup? Uh, Boris Marshak recalled a story that kind of brought this whole cup together. He talked about the tale that comes from Sogdiana and, er and early Indian literature of the four wise fish. And Essentially how the story goes is that there were once four wise fish and the wisest of those fish had 10,000 thoughts. The second had a thousand thoughts, the third ten thoughts, and the last only one thought. The pool that the fish were in began to dry up. And the simple fish, with only one thought, noticed that the pool was drying up, warned the others, and escaped. The other fish, being uh, much more sort of erudite in a way, never cared for the simpleton fish, and they ignored him. All three of those fish ended up perishing. What we see here is a visual depiction of that narrative. The three fish in the middle are all in the wet zone, which is demarcated by very, very subtly gilded uh, concentric circles that make the wet zone in the middle. It's hard to see the gilding, but you can see all their heads inside of that wet area. Their tails, on the other hand, are in the dry zone. And the artist has depicted the fish with personalities, so we see them with faces, but one fish doesn't have a face, he's turned belly up, or rather head down in the water. Perhaps this is the wisest fish who's now dead. The fourth fish, the simpleton, uh, has escaped. As I showed you before, we have on the outer edge the lotuses with the mandarin duck 
uh, with his wingspan open. The Mandarin duck, as I said, is a symbol of the long life and union between the couple and is shown on the lotus, which is also a symbol for the afterlife. So it's kind of good wishes to the newly married couple. It seems as though the donor of this cup, working with the artist, conveyed a message to the married man or the man just going into marriage that he should have a long life, of course, and a beautiful life with his wife, but to throw away uh, false knowledge, arrogance, and ignorance, which is uh, what the three other fish represent, and follow common sense in his life and be that fourth fish. Uh, I see my time's done there, so I'm actually, I'm just going to end with that story and thank you all for your patience. <laughs> it's, it's very hot up here in the very lights, uh, yes. Um, I don't know if there's time for questions. Your questions, if any questions. Hey, we need some Bangka water. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I would like to call and ask for a condition. I'm not sure. That's the main question. Yes, uh, that's a, a, a comment, but a great question. Yeah, yes, and I know you all are really uh, here anyways to see Dr. Paul, and I'm very eager to get to his lecture. So uh, <laughs> maybe if there's no questions, uh, I will excuse myself gracefully and uh, let him take the stage. Okay. I'm trying to run away. <laughs> Motive of the entwined neck ducks? Ah, that's a, that's a good question. I think maybe you might be a better person to answer that question. <laughs> but uh, I really, I really, I really don't know. Uh, but I will look into it. I have seen it in some other places, and I've even seen it in sculpture where two animals will have their necks entwined and often the male and female, but I can't actually answer that question. It occurred to me that in Sanskrit literature and also in Indian art, there's a motive called, yes, you see that Hamsa Mithuna, Hamsa Mithuna, Hamsa being goose, and Mithuna mean, meaning union. So this motive, uh, as far as I know, in literature goes back certainly to the Mahabharata or even to Vedic literature. And in art it is here yes, probably from at least the Kushan period. Okay. So, and it's an os one of the Ashtamangalas also, and it's an auspicious symbol. And it is of the union, of course, as you say. Right. And I was wondering whether its origin was in China or India. I see. Well, what. One thing that I have learned, no, no, I, I think that's right. One thing that I have learned, Dr. Paul, is that the Tibetans uh, draw their myths, as you know, largely from India, but also from the Sogdians. And that the Sogdians and the Indians shared a lot because, in fact, you know, they were really all uh, within the same geographic zone with uh, Gandhara and, and moving all the way up. So uh, I think will find more and more commonalities between those areas than really from China. <coughs> yes? If I want to see some uh, Tibetan artifacts, where, where do you suggest I should go? I mean the largest museum or the... Carlo Christie's gallery right now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but also, uh, there's a number of places that have large collections. Uh, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg has one of the more phenomenal Central Asian silver and gold collections. Many of the objects not labeled Tibet, but they might relabel in the future. Uh, the Met 
has a very good collection. Cleveland Museum, the Ashmolean uh, has a nice collection. So uh, all, all, all around there are uh, pieces. And if you are ever interested, I am happy to share like a bibliography that will send you in all of those directions. So. Thank you. Yeah. Just final question, please. The painting of the hunt, where did you get them from? Uh, that is from a coffin panel, and there are a number of coffin panels very similar to them. Uh, one is in Dulan, there's another uh, in the Met. Those are from a private collection. All right, I'm going to step off now because I see it's that time. So thank you all very much, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs>